questions. I have questions. <laughs> what are you doing? What's going on? Why are we having these conversations? What am I doing here? Today you're alive. And as it is appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. Because every one of us will give an account of himself to God. So you are here. Until that time. What time is that? Please get your authorized version of the scriptures and please read along with me, word for word, verse by verse of what we will be looking at today. We're going to be primarily in the book of Job. This is part two of the video that was done Wednesday. <laughs> Rosh Hashanah, <laughs> the blowing of trumpets. And most of you who aren't devils, or most of, excuse me, most of you who are devils and just stay until like 12 minutes. <laughs> I don't know how any y'all can take any King James Bible William Christian seriously when they fall into the September 23rd, 13th, 23rd thing. Some of you know exactly who I'm making a reference to. To um, a true a true Walkmanite. For a man who doesn't get enough credit for being almost identical to his Messiah, Peter Ruckman. I, I'm, I'm not even making that's I'm not talking about who you may think I am. I'm talking about Breaker Breaker, who has you you look that up, he's got several videos about this whole September twenty third thing. I mean, wow. Crazy. I don't know how any of you can take that guy seriously. But today is Rosh Hashanah, the blowing of trumpets. Okay, and what is it? The um, next, the 24th is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. But anyway, anyway. Read along with me in the scriptures that we are going to be looking at. Be a Berean, search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Read along with me because the mouth will go quicker than the brain sometimes and I'll skip a groove sometimes it happens. Okay? Read along with me. As it is appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. Here's something. Now, you who are atheists don't believe that when you die you're going to go stand before the Lord. I can't help you with that. that that's your problem. Your belief on that alone is irrelevant. When you die, you are going to go and stand before the very one whom you've rejected all your life. Okay? I would not want to be you. I would not want to be you. And, and a lot of these people, that I, I've heard this. I've experienced it. So have so many of you saints with a lot of these people. It's like, well, when I get before God... I have questions. As if they're going to demand of God. But in Ecclesiastes 2, verses 12 on to verse 16, And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath been already done? Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly, as far as light excelleth darkness. A wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. A fool says in his heart, there is no God. A fool says in his heart, there is no God. You who claim to be atheists, and there is no such thing as that, um, you're fools. You say in your heart, there is no God, but yet you are your own God. Boop. Anyway, let's continue. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth on, happeneth to them all. One event is every single one of you and I going to be, be partaker in. We're all going to die. 
We're all going to die. Okay? We're all going to die. <clears throat> then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool who says in his heart there is no God, so it happeneth even to me, King Solomon, the wisest of the wise up to, uh, at this time. Okay? <laughs> yeah. So wait, the people who say in their heart there is no God, they're going to die just like me? Mm-hmm. Yes. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, this, that this also is vanity. What does that mean? King Solomon, who at this time, because, you know, when he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, Jesus Christ hadn't come in the flesh yet. Okay? <laughs> okay? Uh, God was not manifest in the flesh yet, as he was, you know, when he came as the Lamb. Okay? You know, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, by the way. All right? But... God hadn't been manifest in the flesh yet, all right? So, Solomon at this time, who was the wisest man at this time, okay? I say that because, like I said, Jesus Christ hadn't come in the flesh yet, all right? He's like, okay, I have more wisdom than anyone else, but yet that wisdom, fear of the Lord, and the knowledge that Solomon had about trees and all that stuff, couldn't keep him from death, could it? Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. Why was I then? Why and why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this is also vanity, for there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how died the wise man as the fool? Meaning, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. Ecclesiastes 9, verses 1 out of verse 3. For all this I considered in my heart, even to, to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. All things come alike to all. There is one event, death. Okay? There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean and to the unclean, to him that sacrificeth and to him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner. And he that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. <laughs> you know, we we were all born. We're all going to die. Okay, we're all going to die. And as it is appointed on the men once to die, and after this, the judgment. And see, the point of this video is for you atheists and those of you uh, despondent Christians. When you die you're going to go stand before the Lord. And you have the audacity to really believe that you're going to go before the creator of all things, who created even you. Your belief on that is irrelevant. You'll find out the hard way, okay? You will find out the hard way. You think that you're going to go before the Lord with a stonewall attitude and demand of him? Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's full of wonder, isn't it? So hence, that's why I'd like us to look at the book of Job. Now, there are many questions within Scripture. The very first question in Scripture is from Satan. Yea, hath God said. Okay? And you got to remember... Not every question has the word why in it, or is prefaced with a why. You know, whom hast thou here? That's a question. Where art thou? That's a question. Okay? There, you know, why do the heathens rage? 
there's a why question. But see, not every question is prefaced with why. There are a lot of questions in Scripture. Not that we are to question Scripture, but within the Scripture itself, there are questions. Now, I haven't really studied this actual aspect of it, but we will see in this video the bulk of questions as far as designate, designated to one singular book in Scripture is the book of Job. There's a lot of questions in Job. The book of Job itself, like I was asked last night as I slept, uh, you know, email, how can you love, trust, believe in a God who lets the righteous suffer to prove a point? I think that's a fair question. I really do. That's a fair question. Hmm? And see, and what, but see right away, what's the problem with that question in and of itself? Okay? What's the problem with that question? Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Here's the problem with that question. Verse 21, Psalm 50. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such and one as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. That is a question asked of someone who is exalting themselves above God. Okay? All right? But here's, now here's to answer that. Okay? Is our God the Father... Jesus Christ, the creator of everything, even you, is he above doing things to prove a point? The answer to that is no. Example, Exodus chapter 9. Now, don't miss this. Now, we have talked about this, uh, the video addressing stupid head, uh, Christy Burke. Okay, we have addressed this in its entirety, so we're not going to do it here today, but we are just going to touch a little bit on it, okay, because that's a fair question. That's a fair question. In Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 on to verse 17, pay attention to this, okay? Note the number 9 and note the numbers verses 13 on to verse 17. Note this. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may smite, that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. Now, before we continue, verse 15 that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. You have to remember, the pharaohs were looked upon as if they were God. The pharaohs themselves thought they were God. Okay? You have to remember that. Because a lot of people, will, especially when they want to go branch off in the evil heresy of Calvinism, you know, well, Pharaoh, God hardened his heart. Remember, Pharaoh already had made the choice. Pharaoh already had a hardened heart. Pharaoh already believed in his own little lecabesa that he was a god. Okay? He had made a choice. His heart was already hardened. And as scripture shows us, when someone is in that uh, state, in that condition, and don't want truth, and have made their choice, and, are, you know, the Lord will be more than happy to go ahead and guide them on. Okay, to choose their delusions. To give them over onto that deception. Okay, why? Because they have not received the love of the truth. Okay, you have to remember that about Pharaoh when you're encountering these satanic, wicked Calvinists who want to talk about, well, see, God hardens people. Well, Pharaoh already had made a choice. He already believed in his little la cabeza that he was a God. 
His heart was already hardened. God was just going to go ahead and leading him along in it because he had already made his choice. Don't fall for that when these Calvinists come around with that, okay? Watch out for that. Let's continue. Verse 16. And in very deed, for this cause, have I raised thee up for to shew in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Proof of point. Yeah. Verse 17. And yet exaltest thou thyself against my people that thou wilt not let them go. And people will, God hardened his heart. Remember, Pharaoh had already in his heart, had already hardened his heart by believing he was a God and had already made his choice. He even says earlier in Exodus, it's like, who's the Lord? I don't know him. Okay? Okay? All right? So God brought him along in his own self-deception to make an example out of him. Romans chapter 9, don't miss that. Exodus 9, verses 13 on to verse 17. Romans 9, 13 on to 17. Don't, don't miss that beautiful thing there. That's not coincidence. Coincidences don't exist. Mr. <laughs> uh, coincidence theorist, <laughs> whoever you were, crazy guy. Anyway, Romans 9, verses 13 on to verse 17. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. Talking of who? As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Why did God hate Esau? Because Esau despised his birthright. I don't hate you. I despise you. Like I said, look up what it means to despise. Despising is just a little bit more than hate. Okay? All right. Anyway. Why did God hate Esau? Because he despised his birthright. His God was his belly, literally. He sold over his birthright for a bowl of soup, bread and water. Okay? He lightly esteemed his birthright. He despised it. Because it was nothing to him because he chose a bowl of soup over it. See, Esau made a choice. Okay? You have to remember, when reading Romans chapter 9 too. It's in the context of free will. Okay? So let's continue. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but God that sheweth mercy. Yes, grace is simply put unmerited favor. That's that's the simple, stripped-down <laughs> definition for you of God's grace, unmerited favor. The better blessing the lesser, okay? For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might shew my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Pharaoh made a choice. Esau made a choice. You have free will. You have a choice to make, okay? Don't be deceived by the Calvinist who comes here to try to prove to you elect and non-elect. Okay, it's in the context of free will. Okay, watch out for that. Watch out for that. Okay? But see, ultimately though, why, what's the, about the book of Job? Why does God allow the righteous to suffer, right? God is not above proving a point. But Job, 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 chapter 1. Now we're going to do some gleaning through Job, but we're also going to read uh, a few chapters of Job. So be prepared, okay? You don't like a lot of scripture? Go away. It's, it's 19 minutes. Those of you who have the attention span of a gnat don't want to uh, go through any scripture. You're already gone. Fine, okay? Saints are the ones who are usually, and certain select enemies are the ones who will make it. So, Job chapter 1, 
Verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Okay, and now skip down to verses 6 on to verse 7, uh, on to verse 8. Now there was a day when the sons of God, angels, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, here's a question, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Question, Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. See, in its entirety, the book of Job, and I, I was, you know, I'm not going to take the time to study that out, but someone may, I don't know. Collectively, the most of the questions within Scripture collectively are found, I believe, in the book of Job. Okay? I mean, yes, there are, you know, why do the heathen rage? Yea, hath God said. Yes, within many of the books of scriptures, of the scripture, there are questions. Yes, yes. But collectively, in a collective sense, the most of the questions within scripture are found where? In the book of Job. And look at verse 8. That there is none like him in the earth. A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And as we talked about in part one of this video, um, I now am totally convinced and believe that Job is after the flood, before the law, before the exodus. Okay? Now, for our instruction in righteousness today, okay, we have the righteousness of Christ imputed unto us. Okay, hold your place here. If you got a ribbon marker today, you're, you're going to want to use it. Okay, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just one verse, just one verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, a verse that the um, sleazy believist fake gracer has no concept of, true concept of. For he hath made him to be sin for us, verse 21 in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God, when he looks upon us, sees the righteousness of Christ. Okay? Even though we are saints who still sin. Okay? All right? So, our instruction in righteousness, God sees us as Job through the righteousness of Christ, that imputed righteousness. Keep that in mind. Okay? Keep that in mind. But you got to remember, this is a time after the flood, before the law, before the exodus, before the kings, before the division of the land, okay? This is during the time of the patriarchs, I believe, okay? All right? What a, what a testimony. What a testimony. The Lord to say that of Job. Today you come to the Lord on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of the Lord, call upon his name and he saves you. He seals you. He cleanses you of all, all sin, okay? That doesn't mean that you are sinless, okay? You still sin. You read Romans chapter 7, okay? But God looks at you through the righteousness of Christ imputed unto you, okay? Because he saved you and sealed you. You have God living within you, okay? Okay? That's the instruction on righteousness part. Now, look at verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord another question and said, Doth Job fear God for naught, for nothing? And what does Satan do? It's like, hey, go ahead and take away all his stuff. He'll curse you to his face. And the Lord said, what? Okay? Verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself, but not forth thine hand. 
So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Verse 12 is an imperative verse. Okay? You who are not saved, Satan doesn't need God's permission to hurt children that don't belong to him. Okay? You know, like the sons of Siva. Like the sons of Siva. Okay? Where they were caught using, they were taking upon themselves to call upon, uh, uh, to use the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who Paul preached, and the devil, or the devils that were in the, you know, the unclean spirit that was in the guy. He said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? Okay? Satan doesn't need God's permission to afflict children that are not his. A saint's. Satan needs God's permission to afflict us. And see, God will give that permission. Why? Why do the righteous suffer? Hmm? Why? Hopefully we'll come to an, a conclusion about this. But Satan is allowed to do this. Okay? And if Satan is a being allowed to tempt you, why? Okay? As I, as I discussed with uh, uh, my brother last night, um, you know, if the, everything is always going good in your life, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, it's really easy for you to forget about God, isn't it? Why do you think so much of us are in trouble? The more trouble we're in, the closer we are to the Lord, right? It's more difficult to be closer with the Lord the more prosperity you have. That's why in 1 Corinthians it says not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise. Why? Because they have all these things to fall back on. Okay? That's why, praise the Lord, he keeps me and my wife <laughs> clinging to him for everything. Okay? Because if he gave a little bit more, we might lightly esteem. Don't want that. But if you were to continue reading this, what happens? One, two, three, four, and one fell swoop. One after another, after another, after another. Satan is allowed to take all, virtually all, except his wife, all of his substance away. Okay? And what happens? What happens? Job chapter 1, verses 20 on to verse 22. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Everything belongs to him. He gives it to you. He can take it away. And Job didn't charge God foolishly. He shaved his head, gave himself my haircut. It's like, <laughs> thank you, you gave. You know, no longer you walk with the Lord. You know, I, I learned uh, in the month of July, I learned an invaluable lesson about fretting. You would say, well, shouldn't that have been gone? Uh, you know, Brad, you've been saved for over 15 years. Uh, yeah, but it's easy to get to be fretting sometimes. And I learned a valuable lesson about fretting, which isn't going anywhere, praise the Lord. But, you know, you reach a point in your life, it's like, you know, if I can fix it, Lord, let me fix it. If I can't fix it, I'm not going to worry about it. If it's your will, what can I do? Okay? Okay? Fretting. Watch out for fretting. Well, what happens? You know, in Job chapter 2, again, <laughs> the sons of God get together before the Lord. And verse 3 in chapter 2, and the Lord said unto Satan, of course Satan went, before the Lord as well. Satan has to go to before the Lord still. Satan is not yet kicked out of heaven. Okay, he has fallen from heaven. But he, is, he still has to go before the throne. He still has to go before the Lord. Okay, all right. Remember, as it says in the book of Job, where does Satan spend his time? Walking to and fro in the earth. Satan is not omnipresent. I personally believe Satan is at the Vatican, okay? But he is not omnipresent. He can't be in two places at the same time, okay? 
but he's down here walking around. But he has to go into heaven to appear before the Lord. It's not till Revelation chapter 12 till the Lord is like finally is like, Doug, Satan, get out! I've had enough. Go. Okay. All right. Satan has fallen from heaven. He's not kicked out of heaven yet. Keep that in mind. Verse 3 in Job chapter 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? Absolutely. A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and issueth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without a cause. And Satan's like, and verse 4, And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea. All that man, all that a man hath, will he give for his life. It's like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. I took everything away from him, like you said. But put forth thine hand now, the accuser of the brethren, Satan, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said, verse six. The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he's in thine hand. It save his life. Kill him. And he goes and smites Job with boils, basically his pimples from his head to his feet, and then he takes a pot shirt and scraping the pus and ugh. and he also sat in ashes, a sign of mourning. So, okay, if any of you have had chicken pox before, he's sitting there covered with pimples, scraping himself, sitting in ashes. <laughs> Verse nine. Then said his wife unto him. Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. <laughs> but to be fair to the wife of Job, when a man and a woman marry, they are one flesh. That's not only referring to the bedroom, but we are one flesh. Job's wife suffered the same things. Maybe she didn't have zits all over her, but those were her children. That was also her substance. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind about Job. Now Job chapter 3, verses 11 and, uh, 11 and 12. Question. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why did the knees prevent me? Or why the breasts that I should suck? Why, why, why is this happening? Why is... Why? We heard the testimony that God gave of Job himself. Why? Why is this happening? Why? Now see, there's a difference when you do something you know you shouldn't and you're suffering the consequence of, or you do something that you know you should do and you're suffering the consequence of being an ambassador for Christ and you're suffering affliction for standing up uh, for Christ. Okay? Alright? But Job did nothing to warrant this. He didn't. He didn't. But yet God allowed it. Why? Verses 23 on verse 26 in Job chapter 3. Again, questions. Why is light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God hath hedged in? For my sighing cometh before I eat, and my roarings are poured out like the waters. For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. I was not in safety, neither, were, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. Now, in Job chapter 2, we see something. Look at Job 2, verses 11 on to verse 13. <laughs> now, when Job's Three friends. And I got to tell you, as we're going to see, with friends like these, who needs enemies? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Yes. But see, these friends didn't speak right about God. We'll, we'll look at that later. Okay. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliaphaz the Temanite, the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. For they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. 
the ministry of presence. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, disfigured with all the pimples, zits, and boils, and whatnot, okay? They lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days, got down to their level. No. Condescend to be, uh, what is that in Romans 12? Don't be high-minded in your own conceit, but condescend to men of low estate. You know, when someone's mourning, they're on the ground, the floor crying, you know. Sit there. Sit there with them. And shut up! Sometimes, brethren, we, we, especially we as men, we want to fix things, right? But when you're in the presence of someone who is going through incredible suffering, grief, unless the Lord's the one, hey, quiet, be quiet. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him. For they saw that his grief was very great. But what happens? They got to put in their two cents. And the thing about what we're going to look at, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, okay? They spake true things. They did. However, the error and the thing that wore away the stones was the accusation. It was error mixed with truth. Because why, why would God let the righteous suffer? Their logic, right? There must be a reason. It must be your fault. Job chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Eliaphaz, just like, like he says, you know, verse 1, uh, verse 2. If we essay to commune with thee, wilt thou be grieved? But who can withhold himself from speaking? Uh, should have been you, Eliaphaz. Okay. It, they, were, they, they sat with him for, say, what? Seven days. A week. Okay. They sat with him. Didn't say a word. Just sat there in silence. Just to be there. The ministry of presence. Okay. Finally, they were like so taken aback. It's like, dude, I gotta say something. You know, when you get that to that point when you have to say something, pray and consider, Lord, is this what you want me to do, or is this me? But what happens? They open their mouth, and every single one of them levels an accusation against them, which wasn't true. Verses six and seven. Accusation. Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, and the uprightness of thy ways? Accusation. Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? Two questions in the form of an accusation. So, okay. Verse 6, he's basically saying, Job, you're a little high and mighty on yourself, ain't you? And verse 7. You, you must have done something. Bad things just don't happen to good people for no reason, right? Right? Have you made God into your own image? Huh? Okay? And also, now, that's Eliphaz. Okay? Uh, look at Job 15. That was a mild, a mild accusation. But when you get to Job 15 and Job gives great answers and whatnot, Eliphaz gets a little uppity and just comes right, slams it in his face. Okay? Job 15 verses 1 on verse 9 now. Then answered Eliphaz the Temanite and said, Question! Should a wise man utter vain knowledge and fill his belly with the east wind? Should he reason with unprofitable talk or with speeches wherewith he can do no good? <laughs> Yea, thou castest off fear 
and restrain his prayer before God. I think Eliphaz was a little ticked off, wouldn't you, about Job's answers. I think he got his little tushy hurt, you know. For thy mouth uttereth thine iniquity. Accusation. And thou choosest the tongue of the crafty. Thine own mouth condemneth thee. Not, and not I. Oh, she could have fooled me. <laughs> Yea, thine own lips testify against thee. Art thou the first man that was born? Question. Or wast thou made before the hills? Hast thou heard the secret of God? And dost thou restrain wisdom to thyself? What knowest thou that we know not? What understandest thou which is not in us? What, you think you're better than us? Who are you, Job? Questions. Coupled with accusations. Job 8. Bildad. I beg your pardon. You know, Bildad was a pretty short guy. Really? Yeah, he was a shoe height. I'm sorry. Never mind. Job chapter 8. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Job chapter 8, verses 1 and verse 6. Okay, Eliph Eliphaz. He was he, No, pretty full of himself as well. Leveling accusations against Job. And Job answered all right. But see, something was going on. There's only so much we can take, right? Even Paul, even Paul, with that, that devil-possessed woman, that woman that had the spirit of divination. Well, that wasn't the devil. Shut up, go away, okay? Even he was grieved, and he looked and turned at her. I command thee, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, get out of her. Okay? My wife and I, one day, oh, uh, what, a couple years ago or a year ago, we were walking down with the dog, and a devil-possessed woman was, uh, you know, going down the street harassing us. That also happened to me while I was at Jewel witnessing onto a homeless guy and this same devil-possessed woman screaming at the top of her lungs. It's like doing the same thing, okay? The waters where the stones getting a little ahead of ourselves. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, we're reading verse 6 here in Job 8. How long wilt thou speak these things? And how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? Questions! Doth God pervert judgment? Or doth the Almighty pervert, pervert judgment? Verse 4. If thy children have sinned against him, and he hath cast them away for their transgression. If thou wouldest seek unto God betimes and make thy supplication to the Almighty. Accusation. See, he accused his children. And you would read in the book of Job that Job's like, hey, I don't know if they cursed God in their hearts, so he went and made an offering. Okay? And remember, the law wasn't in written form until after the Exodus. Okay? Remember that. So he was just doing that. He's like, hey, Lord, I don't know if my children did this, so here, take it easy on them, okay? I'm fraternizing that horribly, okay? But it's like, okay, there was something wrong with your kids. Scripture doesn't support that. Scripture doesn't support that, okay? Well, if thy children have sinned against him and he have cast them away for their transgression, hmm, and you read in Job chapter 1, that, wait a minute, Job offered for them in case they did something, and Satan was allowed to do that, and Satan killed them all to get to Job. Okay? Okay? Verse 6, If thou wert pure and upright, there's the accusation, accusing Job of not, Job of not being what? Pure and upright. And what did God say of Job? <laughs> what did God say of Job? Verse 8 in Job 1, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, 
a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Okay? So Bildad is accusing Job of something God declared him to be. Accusation and questions. Accusation with questions. Okay? And that is throughout the entirety of the discourse back and forth. Okay? Zophar, Bildad, and Eliaphaz had truth mingled in with what they were saying. Okay? But in their accusation against Job is where they were wrong. Okay? Go to Job 11 now. So far. Verses 1 on to verse 17. Uh-uh. 1 on to verse 7. Then answered Zophar the Namathite and said, Should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? Ah, Job, you're just speaking out of your rear end. Hmm. Should thy lies. He's accusing Job of being a liar. A perfect and upright one, man. A man that feared God and escheweth evil. And yet, so far. Okay. Eliaphaz was saying that he wasn't pure and that he was arrogant. Bildad, you've done something, and even your kids. Zophar is calling him a liar. These are his friends who mingled truth with error. You remember that rat poison is 95% good food, but it's that 5% that kills you? Should not the multitude of words be answered, and should a man full of talk be justified? Should thy lies make men hold their peace, and when thou mockest, shall no man make thee ashamed? For thou hast said, My doctrine is pure, I am clean in thine eyes. But oh, that God would speak, and he does, and open his lips against thee, and that he would shew thee the secrets of wisdom that they are doubled to that which is. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. Truth! Truth! As I believe we covered in yesterday's video. He doesn't reward us according to our iniquities. Why? Because he remembereth our frame that we are dust. If God rewarded us according as we deserved, there wouldn't be any one of us left. And he would be just to do so. Truth! Truth. Error. He's calling Job a liar. You see how this works? Verse 7. Canest thou by searching find out God? Canest thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Questions. Now see, what is going on here? Go to Job 14. Job 14. Job 14, verses 7 on to verse 19. Check this out. The verse we want is 19, but we want context. For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud, and bring forth bows like a plant. And out of his belly shall come forth living water. Hold your place here and check out Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar, who I have no doubt in my mind is in heaven. Okay? A heretic, you know, wanted to dispute this because he wanted to defend himself. So he can keep up the facade that he's actually a saved man and he's not. Daniel chapter 4, verses 14 on to verse 16. Okay, just, just a point of reference here. Daniel chapter 4, verses 14 on to verse 16. He cried aloud and said, Thus hew down the tree, and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his, branch, from his branches. Uh, Daniel, you know, this is the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, and he goes to Daniel, and Daniel... Uh, tells him to dream again, okay? We're just checking this out. 
Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the, in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Hmm. Until what? Until he acknowledges that the Lord is God. Okay? Okay? And also, too, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, no, 2 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 1. Okay? When everything is going peachy keen in your life, it's very easy to misplace, God forbid, your relationship with the Lord. Because why? Everything is going good for you. So you need a little, sometimes, affliction. Why? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 on to verse 11. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Trust in ourselves. That's easy to do when things are going well with you. Now Job was perfect and upright. But see, the wearing away of the stones, the constant barrage of attack, of accusation, of accusation, with his friends, who at first were doing right to keep their mouths shut, but then they wanted to put their two cents in. And as we already looked at, Eliaphaz in chapter 15, he really like threw off all restraints. It's like, yeah, 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 you know? But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. But in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. You know, why didn't Job's <laughs> three friends when they opened their mouth, pray and comfort. They tried, but yet they accused him. Go back to Job 14. Okay. Picking up at verse 10. But man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost. And where is he? As the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decayeth and dryeth up. See, mention of a flood. Okay. We don't know if this is an actual reference onto the flood of Noah, but like we discussed in the previous video, I am now 110% convinced that Job is after the flood. Okay, let's continue. So man lieth down and riseth not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave. Then thou wouldest keep me secret until thy wrath be passed, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Oh, we can go off on that one. Till my change come, you know, till you die, okay? Or until... In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, come up hither. Okay, just a thought. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to the work of thine hands. Okay, I'm not saying that verses 14 and 15 are directly talking about the redemption. I'm not saying that. But look at that. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait. Till my change come, we shall not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Okay? Thou shalt call, come up hither, and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to the work of thine hands. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Okay? You roll that one around in your head. 
the scriptures don't talk about the redemption of the purchase possession. You're blind. Okay, that video will be in the description box, okay? The redemption of the purchase possession. Okay? Anyway, let's continue. For now thou numberest my steps, dost thou not watch over my sin? My transgression is sealed up in a bag, and thou sowest up mine iniquity. And surely the mountain falling cometh to naught, and the rock is removed out of his place. Hmm. Hmm. Verse 19. The waters wear the stone. Thou washest away the things which grow out of the dust of the earth, and man is made out of dust, and thou destroyest the hope of man. The waters wear the stones. Another good um, verse here in Job 14 that could point uh, that, you know, like I said, I, I am totally convinced now that Job is after the flood. Yeah, that's some pretty good evidence there too as well. But the waters wear the stones. Okay. Evolutionists say that Grand Canyon was made over millions and millions of whatever. Uh, no, I believe they were made um, probably in a matter of minutes, maybe not even just an hour, with the sheer magnitude and force of the flood and the flood waters and stuff like that, okay? Okay? But the waters were the stones. And remember, in Revelation 17, verse 15, people are likened onto waters. And you have Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar doing what? Wearing away at Job. Job answering their questions, giving a reason of the hope that is in him. But yet, they still nagged at him, wear at him, gnawed at him, gnawed at him, gnawing. No, not. Job 25. Now here we're going to get into some reading. Here is the last of Job's three friends making a statement. Okay? Job 25. Hopefully we can finish this chapter in the time limit. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, Dominion and fear are with him. He maketh peace in his high places. Question. Is there any number of his armies? And upon whom doth not his light arise? How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, let's continue. Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less is man that is a worm? And in Mark chapter 9, you read, Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is never quenched. Uh, hey, geniuses, hell is eternal. The lake of fire is eternal. You're going to burn forever. You're not going to be annihilated. Wow! The lake of fire is not purgatory to purge you so that you will eventually be... That's insanity. That's veiled Catholicism. Watch out for idiots who sport my beautiful haircut who preach that. Okay? Watch out for those guys. How much less man that is a worm and the son of man, which is a worm. Now, remember some of the questions, especially from Eliaphaz, like, who are you, blah, blah, blah. Check this out. We're going to read chapter 26 in its entirety. Okay? Now, like I said, this is the last statement of Job's three friends. At this point, Job goes off. Okay? Because you have 26, 27, 28... Up to chapter 32. So you have from 26 on to 32, Job just, you know, going, going nuts. Just like, ah! Why? 
the wearing of the stones. We are admonished in Scripture to not answer a fool according to his folly. And this is something that the enemy, especially my own personal enemies, especially one in particular, even though over time it's, shut up, man, go to hell already. But this is something that the enemy is good at with us saints. Okay? Remember Romans chapter 7. Okay? That which I do, I allow not. But that which I hate, that I do. Okay? Unfortunately, even in the Apostle Paul, there was a point where he's like, ah, you know, hold your place here. Before we read chapter 26, okay? Um, getting a little ahead of ourselves, but go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, to show you this point, okay? This is not an excuse to fly off the handle. We are to have composure, okay? Uh, we are a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards, okay? We are to have composure. We are to have a little self-government, yes. However, a constant barrage of wearing away of the stones. We are lively stones. Even Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 11 on to verse 15. I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me. Paul was being constantly barraged with people questioning him. Paul, the greatest of the church of the living God, the greatest of saints, even he could reach a point where it's like, <laughs> okay? Read Romans chapter 7. This is not a justification for us to lose our cool. We are to be meek. We are to have composure. We are to have decorum. Okay? You look at a lot of these sleazy believists, they go off just like that, man. Okay? They go, and they antagonize one another. Okay? But never mind about that. I am become a fool in glory, and ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For nothing am I behind the very, very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you, in all patience, in signs and wonders, and mighty deeds. Remember, there were Jews there also, because the Jews require a sign. For what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches, except it be, this is sarcasm, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? <laughs> Forgive me this wrong. Uh, right there you could say that Paul was being a smart Alex. <laughs> I love you, brother. <laughs> Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Chapter 13, verses 100, verse 3. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. Okay? Paul's like, look, I don't want to do this, but you kind of, you know, I'm going to come. It's like, oi, vey, what's wrong with you guys? Okay? He being the loving father that he was the fatherly type, you know, like it says here uh, in verse 14 in chapter 12, okay, the parents ought, uh, um, for the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children, okay? He was like, okay, look, I'm going to let you have it. Verse 3 in chapter 13. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which is toward you, which, it toward, eh, which to you word is not weak, but mighty in you. Okay? All right? Seeking a proof that Paul was actually who he was. Okay? All right? We looked at this why. Paul was being attacked. 
And Paul put off, put off, pull it off until it reached the point where he had, you know, he's like, ah, you've compelled me. Okay, I, I'm a fool. You know, it's foolish for you to have to go through your credentials. Okay, but sometimes things like that, you know, I'm speaking like a fool. You leave me no choice. Okay, I got to say these things. Okay, why was that happening? Why? Because of a wearing of the stones. Go back to Job. Job 25 was the straw that broke the camel's back. Job had reached that point through antagonizing, through the wearing of the stones, giving be, being fed 95% good food with that deadly 5% that'll kill you. And Job finally reached a point like, ah! Now pay attention. We're going to read Job chapter 26 in its entirety. Pay attention to this. Questions. But Job answered and said, How hast thou helped him that is without power? Job has helped those without power. How savest thou the arm that hath no strength? How hast thou counseled him that hath no wisdom? And how hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is? How have you done this? To whom hast thou uttered words? And whose spirit came from thee? Those four verses. Those four questions. But see, now, Job was brought to a point of defending himself through agitation, through wearing away of the stones. Okay? Job lost his cool. Like I said, from 26 on to 32, you basically have Job going off. And what happens? You can read this on your own. Job begins to speak foolishly. Don't take my word for it. you got to do some of your own study. We're not going to read from 26 on to 32. We're not going to do that. Okay? You go ahead and do it on your own time. Job begins to speak foolishly. Okay? And he overdoes it. Man who is perfect and upright and escheweth evil. Who done gave himself my haircut and worshipped uh, the Lord for everything, even in the worst. Even when his wife is saying, saying uh, retain thou integrity, retainest thou thine integrity, curse God and die. And Job's like, what? You speak like a foolish woman. What, are we going to take good from the Lord only and not evil? But see, this constant barrage wore away the stones. Verse 5. Dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. Hell is naked before him and the destruction hath no covering. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. He bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds and the cloud is not rent under them. He holdeth back the face of his throne, and spreadeth his cloud upon it. He hath compassed the waters with bounds, until the day and night come to an end. The pillars of heaven tremble, and are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. Again, uh, looking at this, more evidence that, yes, Job is after the flood. Okay? By his spirit, that's a lowercase s, one that he imparts. By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens. His hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Satan is a created being. Satan is a created being. Job 41, okay, Job 41 is talking, the Lord is talking about Satan, Leviathan, okay. Lo, these are the parts of his ways. But how little a portion is heard of him. But the number of his power, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? 
And Job, in his grief, his friends, who should have just shut up, harangued him, barraged him, wore the stones away. Even Job, a perfect and upright man, had a point to where he couldn't take it anymore. His friends should have been praying with him. His friends should have assuaged his grief. Job says that. Uh, I could heap up words against you. I could accuse you like you're doing to me. But if I were in your shoes, I would assuage your grief. I wouldn't heap accusations against you. You can find, find that on your own in the book of Job. Okay? But see, his three friends did exactly that. They have God said? Hmm? Yea, hath God said? Yea, skin for skin, yea. All that a man hath will he give for his life. But that's just bone in his flesh. Even if Satan was allowed to do that. But how did Satan, was Satan still allowed to continue? I believe so. How? Through Job's three friends. Like I said, with friends like Eliaphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, who needs enemies? Okay? But see, Job, through that barrage, began to justify himself. Began to kind of lift himself up on high. You don't take my, read it for yourself. And hence, remember, no one was pointing a gun. The devil wasn't pointing a gun at, uh, at Job's head. Neither was the Lord. But see, Job he lost his cool. Job went off. And what happens when we go off? Anger resteth in the bosom of fools. A fool's mouth calleth for strokes. We're not fools because we, we don't say in our hearts there is no God, those of us who are saved. But we can sure behave foolishly. And whereas, God, and whereas Job at the beginning did not charge God foolishly, you read from 26 on to 32. Go ahead. Job starts to do what? Job 32. The young whippersnapper. Eliu, the young whippersnapper. <laughs> Job 32. Just verses 1 and 3. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. It says it right there. Job, because of the barrage, it's not an excuse. It's a reason. Okay? Job, because of his three friends who wore away the stones, was reminding, hey, I'm righteous. And he is. He was. But you know what? God doesn't care for someone declaring their righteousness under, under any circumstance. Remember what we looked at in 2 Corinthians? We had the sentence of death in ourselves that we don't depend on ourselves, but God who raiseth the dead... Job's going off. Okay. Wouldn't you have gone off? I would have, yeah. Surely. Of course. I can understand it. But see, when you go off like that, yeah, you yeah, really got to be careful. Because you read James about the tongue that boasteth itself of big things and it's a little member. Huh? So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Young whippersnapper. Then was kindled the wrath of Eliu, the son of Barachel, the Buzite of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. And you read from 26 to chapter 32 and under the circumstances that's exactly what Job ended up doing he started out 
not charging God foolishly, but because of the reason of his three friends who were constantly barraging him. He slipped. That which I do, I allow not. But that which I hate, that do I. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled, because they had found no answer and had yet condemned Job. Now, we're not going to read more about Elihu the young whippersnapper. And interesting, interestingly enough, when the Lord finally speaks, he doesn't address Elihu at all. Elihu was more on base than Eliaphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. However, even Elihu had the, well, you, there must have been something. Even Elihu. Nowhere near as brazen as Eliaphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. But even Elihu had a, well, there must be something. And with Job going off as he did, Job let a little pride come out. Job let a little pride come out. Like I said, you look. The Lord does not at all address Elihu. And what was that one thing from going off from 26 on to verse 32, uh, on to chapter 32? Job did what? He declared himself righteous because he justified himself rather than God. Job was right. Job was righteous. God said so. But see, in that affliction and that constant barraging. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. How many of the enemy how many of my personal enemies who would beat me to death with a baseball bat and a drunken stupor and drive me over with a car? Okay? How many of them have gotten to me to where I fly off and they sit back it's like <laughs> I got gotcha. you? Be not like a fool. And when you let yourself go and fly off the handle, you behave foolishly. Hence. Now, remember in Job 26, the, those first four verses where Job, Job at his breaking point is like, ah, what of you? Who are you? Uh, you know, and the inference, if you continue, Job is like, okay, you guys didn't do this, but look at me. Then what happens? Job 38 and Job 39. Questions. <laughs> you know, some of you people think you're going to stand for the Lord at the great white throne of judgment. And you think you're going to have a barrage of questions for God. Some of you Christians who are going to stand at the great white throne of judgment. You think you're going to have a whole, a whole laundry list to ask God? Job 38. We're going to read this whole chapter. You ready? Questions. You're going to go before the Lord. <laughs> you, dirt. Thinking that, you know, you make, got you lower God down below you. Like we saw in Psalm 50. You're going to demand a, oh, boy. <laughs> I can, you can't see. Let him go. That can, the, the, the thought of that. You got questions for the Lord, huh? Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? He's not addressing Elihu. He's addressing Job. Not Elihu. For whatever reason, the Lord just 
skipped over Eliyahu. Eliyahu over Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar spoke far better than Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. But he, even Eliyahu, said there must be something. And that pride that came out through aggravation, through trial, the refining. If there is something in me that needs to be worked on, Lord, show me. And even if there is iniquity in me, even the Lord will reveal this unto you. But yet, God himself said Job was perfect and upright. But under the worst horrific circumstances and by his friends accused, Job broke. And in that, pride came out. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? You guys, you think you're going to stand before the Lord, huh? You atheists and you evolutionists, you Christians, right? Gird up now thy loins like a man. For I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. I will demand of thee. Let, let, let that roll around in your head a little bit. Why did you make me this way? Why am I here? And the Lord's like, you're dirt. Who in Hades do you think you are? Questions? Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Millions and millions of... Shut up! Who hath laid the measures thereof? If thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon the foundations thereof... Fa whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy... Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb when I made the cloud the garment thereof and thick darkness a swaddling band for it? <laughs> you, you're going to question the Lord? You're going to question the Lord. And break up for it my decreed place? And set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. And here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know his place? What, you think you're God? <laughs> I can't tell you. I, I, I don't know, but I mean... Can you imagine by the Creator, the one that you have mocked and despised and rejected your whole life, drilling you like this? You know what's going to happen? It's going to be pissing down your leg. You're going to pisseth down your leg in horror, in fear, in terror. That it might take hold of the ends of the earth that the wicked might be shaken out of it? Is it? It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. And from the wicked their light is withholden, and the high arm shall be broken. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea, or hast thou walked in the search of the depth? Have the gates of death been opened unto thee, or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? You know, all those charismatic guys who say, well, I am, you know, like Joel Osteen, they think they, create, they can create things. Wow! Don't want to be in their shoes. Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. Where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for the darkness, where is the place thereof? That thou shouldest take it to the bound thereof, and that thou shouldest know the paths, the paths 
to the house thereof? Knowest thou it? Because thou wast then born? Or because the number of thy days is great? See, you've got to remember, God is not confined to time as you and I are. Here's time. God is here. God is not bound by time as you and I. In heaven, it's not September, uh, it's September 15th, 2023. It isn't. Okay? It isn't. God is outside of our time. Okay? You and I are bound by time. God isn't. Okay? Let's continue. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? Remember in uh, World War II, uh, when, uh, what was it, the Germans went into Russia to invade Russia or something like that, and the winter, the snow, the cold just destroyed them, basically? I might have that backwards, but that's something that happened during World War II, okay? By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? Who hath divided the water course for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning of thunder, to cause it to rain on the earth, where no man is, on the wilderness wherein there is no man, to satisfy the desolate and waste ground? And to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth, hath the rain a father? <laughs> or who hath begotten the drops of dew? Out of whose womb came the ice, and the hooray frost of heaven? Who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. You're going to stand before God and ask him questions? Who do you think you are? Well, you're, you're an atheist. You are your own God. Because you decide what is right and wrong. And you're going to stand before the God who is. And, <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay, let's continue. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pallades, or loose the band of Orion, Canst thou bring canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season, or canst thou guard guide Arcturus with his sons? Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? <laughs> canst thou lift up thy voice to the clouds, that abundance of waters may cover thee? And again, think about these. These guys like Kenneth Copeland and these, uh, you know, well, I, uh, Kenneth Hagen, you know, uh, you don't have God living in you. You are one. You atheists. You are your own God. <laughs> and today, the prosperity nitwits, through the, like Mary Baker Eddy, the foundation of it, of the uh, mind science, sciences. Uh, you know, if you believe it, you can achieve it. If you state it, you can create it, right? Like the secret, the religion of Joel Osteen. <laughs> yeah. Canst thou send lightnings that they may go and say unto thee, here we are? Who hath put, put wisdom in the inward parts? Wisdom, fear the Lord. Or who hath given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds in wisdom? Or who can stay the bottles of heaven when the dust groweth into hardness and the clods cleave fast together? Wilt thou hunt the prey for the lion or fill the appetite of the young lions when they couch in their dens and abide in the covert to lie in wait? Who provideth the raven his food when his young ones cry unto God they wander for lack of meat? <laughs> Questions, huh? Let's keep reading. Chapter 39. Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Hey, you atheists. You, you evolutionists. Why don't you answer these questions? Huh? Why don't you, atheist, evolutionist, answer the questions 
that God gave to Job? Why don't you answer those questions? Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Or canest thou mark when the hens do calve? Canest thou number the months that they fulfill? Or knowest thou the time when they bring forth? They bow themselves. They bring forth their young ones. They cast out their sorrows. Their young ones are in good liking. They grow up with corn. They go forth and return not unto them. Who has sent out the wild ass free? Or who hath loosed the bands of the wild ass? Whose house I have made the wilderness and the barren land his dwellings? He scorneth the multitude of the city. Neither regardeth he the crying of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture, and he searcheth after every green thing. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Yes, there was uh, such a thing as unicorns. Were they the, these white horses with the beautiful gold horns who fart rainbows? <laughs> uh, no, I don't believe that the unicorn was a horse with the horn. Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. Well, what was a unicorn according to Scripture? I don't know. But the Scripture says there were unicorns. I believe it. Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valley after thee? Will thou trust him because his strength is great? Or wilt thou leave thy labor to him? So obviously the unicorn, and this is where people th start thinking that he was a horse. But I don't think so. Let's continue. Wilt thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather it into thy barn? Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich, which leaveth her eggs in the earth, and warmeth them in the dust, and forgetteth that the foot may crush them, or that the wild beast may break them? She is hardened against her young ones, as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear. Why? Because God hath deprived her of wisdom. Fear of the Lord. Neither hath he imparted to her understanding. What time she lifteth up herself on high, she scorneth the horse and his rider. Hast thou given the horse strength? I'm mispronouncing that purposely. Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? And remember, we are admonished to not be like the horse or the mule who must be held in with bit and bridle. We need to have decorum. We need to have composure, self-government. And what does Peter talk about? I believe it is Peter. These are they that despise government, talking about controlling themselves. Okay? Oscar Wilde once said, the best way to get rid of a, te a temptation is to give in to it. Brilliant! Yeah! Yeah! Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed men. He mocketh at fear and is not affrighted. Neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him, the glittering spear and the shield. He swalloweth the ground with fierceness and rage. Neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He saith among the trumpets, Ha ha! And he smelleth the battle afar off the thunder and the captains and the shouting. Doth the hawk fly by thy wisdom <laughs> and, stretch a, and stretch her wings toward the south? Doth the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth on the rock, upon the crag of the rock and the strong place. From thence she seeketh the prey and her eyes behold afar off. Her young ones also suck up blood. And where the slain are, there is she. Talk about questions. And the Lord isn't done with the questions to Job. Now we're not going to continue in these questions. But now, the Lord takes a moment. 
okay? The Lord takes a moment. Like I said, there are questions throughout Scripture, but the bulk of questions asked within Scripture are found. I mean, I forget what the actual number of the questions that the Lord asked Job, but they're like in the hundreds. And you're going to stand before the Lord thinking you're something that you're not being dust. Job 40, verses 1 under verse 7. Okay? Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. And there, right now, right now, there are evolutionists out there who dare to say, well, yes, we can. Good luck at the great white throne of judgment when you die and you're in hell burning and then you get out to go to the great white throne of judgment to inevitably be cast in the lake of fire. <laughs> Good luck, boy. Good luck. Look at what Job, look, look at how he responds. Okay? Keep this in mind. See, us saints, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? The judgment seat of Christ. Those who don't make it to the judgment seat of Christ will stand at the great white throne of judgment. And either way, you are going to behold the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father. You are going to be in the presence of the Creator. And you think you're going to be haughty. Wow. Wow, man. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice. But I will proceed no further. Hmm. Well, the Lord went easy on him, right? Really? <laughs> then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man, tough guy. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. Let's read verse 8. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Which is kind of what Job ended up doing. You have questions, huh? You better be careful. It's, it's okay to have questions. If you have, we, we address this in part one. There's a right way and there's a wrong way to ask questions of the Lord. The Lord is not obligated to answer any of your questions. He can and he will sometimes. But some things you just aren't going to know. Go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Now, with what we just looked at, for those of you who think you're something more than you ought to think you are, that ought to terrify you. You're thinking that you're going to stand before the Lord with all these questions and that you know better than God. Job 38 and 39 and 40 there. And if you were to continue, you would read about Behemoth. You would read about Satan, Leviathan. Okay? But... Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 on to verse 14. I beheld till the throne, thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the, like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the 
books were opened. And I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Making reference, of course, unto what? The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that kingdom of heaven that he will establish. Daniel chapter 10 now, verses 8 on to verse 14. There, there I was left alone, and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned into me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yeah, because he saw things. He saw the future. He saw the glory of the Lord. He saw these things. And was he indignant? No. Daniel was like spent. He retained no strength. Verse 9. Yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face. And my face toward the ground. Okay. At what Daniel saw, he was, was he indignant? No. Where was his face? It was on the ground. Y'all think that, like, Christianity thinks that when you, you know, teach you that when you get up to heaven, the Lord who loves you unconditionally uh, is going to, you're going to, oh, Jesus, and you're going to have a bro hug. You're crazy. Or these guys, these evolutionists, they, they stand before the Lord at the great white throne. It's like, okay, God, I got oh, 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 oh. Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Don't worry, we're going to get to Revelation here in a second. Okay? Okay? Let's continue here to verse 14. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees, and upon the palm of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understands, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for I, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy word. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Below Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. Now am I come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is yet is yet for yet the vision is for many days. Mm, beg your pardon. Okay. Now um, now, I believe this was Gabriel who was sent unto him. Okay, I believe it was. I might have that wrong, but whatever. The point is, Daniel, seeing visions of the future, being in the presence thereof, was what? On his face. In fear, shaking. You think when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, Dear saint, hey, Jesus, bro, hey, man, bro. Are you crazy? And you, evolutionist, atheist. It's like, okay, God, I got a question. Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, just one verse. You know, John, the apostle, the one who leaned on the breast of Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. And when I saw him, the Lord, 
I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Let's read 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. So when John saw the Lord, he was as a dead man. And you all think that you're going to be indignant and, Hey, Jesus! You, no. No. Job 42. Job 42. Verses 1 on to verse 6. And after the Lord had ended his questions and his drilling of Job, then on Job 42, verses 1 on to verse 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden, withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself, and repent. Second Corinthians chapter four. Second Corinthians chapter four. You know, the one that you reject all your life and think that he is underneath you and that you compare yourself to. I don't think I'm a God. Yes, you do. You are your own judgment, your own standard of judgment. Yes, you do, atheist. You don't there's no such thing as an atheist. You are your own God. You don't know who it is you are dealing with. You don't. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 15 on to verse 18. Why do the righteous suffer? We have to keep this one thing in mind. Verses 15 on to 18. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God. The glory of God. Oh, what a concept. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The inner man of the heart. The inner man. Okay? And who is our inner man? The Lord Jesus Christ, if we're saved. Right? Okay? For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. What is our life? It's a vapor. At the best, we're going to live 70 years. If by reason of strength, 80 years, and some could even live up by reason of strength, we're a vapor. For God who is not bound by time, a thousand years is nothing. A hundred years is a blink. For our light afflictions. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. This is for a moment. You're going to be dead for a long time. And you're either going to be with the Lord... For eternity? Or you're going to spend eternity burning? Eternally minded. Job's sufferings for, were for a moment. But the eternal perspective. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. 
For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Righteous, why do the righteous suffer? Well, the one thing we have to remember, that the righteous suffer for Christ's sake, yes, but also you have to remember the eternal perspective. This is not it. You're not going to die. I mean, your body will become warm for you, sure, but you're going to spend eternity in one of two places, in heaven with the Lord or in the lake of fire, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. The devil is not in hell. The devil does not run hell. Okay? That's where the devil is going eventually. Okay? For a while yet, but that's where he's going to end up, in the lake of fire which is eternal. Eternal torment or eternal all bliss and joy with the Lord. That's the only two options. There is no option C. Okay? You have to have an eternal mindset. You're going to die. Where are you going to go? Your friend. Well, we're at it. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 on to verse 39. Okay? We who are saved, who come to the Lord on His terms, and He saves us and seals us. Romans 8, 35 on to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Look, you're not saved. God's love is not for you. God does not love you unconditionally. Okay? God's love is available for you at Calvary. But you have to go the way he says to get his love. Not boot the door out of the way and climb up some other way. Okay? You go the way he prescribed and he saves you. Who shall separate us, save people, from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written... For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that, past tense, loved us. Okay? Why? Why are we conquerors? Because this can't destroy our soul. Remember, all that Satan can do through the Jesuits and through everything is kill this. You kill the body, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Job's suffering was horrific. But at the end of the day, Job is with the Lord. The eternal perspective. Why do the righteous suffer? Well, because God has ordained it. God allows the righteous to suffer. But you also have to remember the eternal perspective. These light afflictions, dear saints, are for a moment. We're going to be with the Lord for eternity. Your light afflictions are for a moment. You deny the true God the true Lord Jesus Christ of the authorized version of the scriptures, you deny him, your suffering will be for eternity. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. questions huh you know when I read about how the Lord just goes off on Job with those questions the longer you walk with the Lord the questions cease you, you have questions but it's like you know what I don't need to know the answers to all things I have trust I have faith in my Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
If he wants me to know the answer, he will reveal it to me. If I ask him the answer, and if he gives it to me, great. If he asks, if I ask and he's like, you don't need to know. That's good for me. Okay? Listen, your friend. You're going to die. And your belief on what happens after your death is irrelevant. It really is. Because as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this to judgment, you, it doesn't matter what you believe in this. It doesn't. Your belief in this aspect is irrelevant. When you die, you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father. Where are you going to go? Going to be with the Lord? Or, or are you going to go to hell? I don't believe in hell. That's irrelevant. If the Lord doesn't save you, that's where you're going. And you're not going to go there to burn up, to convert you, to get saved. That's Catholicism. You know, there's a saying, be careful what you wish for, you might just get it. That's going to be it for this video. This is part two, Job the Book of Questions, part two. Uh, the, this, the first part will be linked for in this and vice versa. Um, hopefully this will help some of you. Hopefully, too, um, for those of you who think more highly of yourselves than you ought to think, hopefully this will kind of wake you up a little bit. So, I'm going to get this uploaded. Thank you for watching this if you do. We love you. Thank you. We'll see you in the next video.